There are pros and cons to everything, and that includes creatine. And before you start taking creatine, it's important to understand some of the drawbacks. Now, I am gonna help you overcome them and understand if you should be using creatine or not, but we do need to take a look at the negative side effects as well. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Hey, after today's video, 30% off discount link for Thrive Market. They are an online membership-based grocery store. That link down below is gonna get you 30% off literally your entire grocery order plus a free $50 gift. So if you grocery shop, like you're a normal human that goes to the store and gets groceries, it really makes sense to give them a shot because A, you get 30% off, B, it gets delivered to your doorstep, and C, the foods that they have are foods that are better than what's at the grocery store. Plus, they have some of the same foods at the grocery store, they just actually vet them out. So they do the work for you in terms of making sure the foods that are there are sorted by particular category, like keto, sugar-free, um, whether they're vegan, paleo, whatever, does all that work for you. Like imagine walking into Safeway or Kroger or Publix or something and being like, hey, there's a sign that says keto. Hey, there's a sign that says sugar-free. Hey, there's a sign that says vegan. And you just go that way and go down that aisle and it's got everything. That's the way they are. So anyway, that link is down below. Check them out after this video. Okay, the first one, the one that we really need to address is, is it a steroid? Is it actually going to be negative in that effect? The short answer is no, okay? We have to address this one first and foremost. And I know it's not like a typical con, but it's a common misconception. It is not like a steroid. It is not exogenous energy. It is not exogenous muscle building. Okay, what creatine is, is something that helps you refill your existing stores or your natural ability to hold creatine. So we get creatine when we eat steak, we get creatine when we eat salmon, and we have a natural like level that we can get to. Unfortunately, most of us do not get to that level. Some of us do. Some of us eat enough meat, some of us produce enough endogenously that we actually fill our creatine stores up and maybe supplementing wouldn't give us much benefit. But there is some small, small data that suggested that there is a, what is called a DHT, dehydrate testosterone conversion. DHT is tightly, tightly, tightly regulated in our body. So if we have a lot of DHT forming and we have too much of it, it's going to kind of try to get out. That's the best way to explain it. And it affects our follicles and affects losing hair and it can affect acne, can make uh, oily skin, all this. It's a very real thing. The thing is, is that over 500 different peer-reviewed papers, major, major meta-analysis, major reviews, and we've only seen one, sort of one and a half, that have kind of indicated there's a DHT conversion. The one study, I believe it was in 2009, that took a look at rugby players that found that they were having DHT conversion and hair loss with creatine. It's very interesting because we haven't seen that otherwise. And my team and I kind of looked at this and we have some theories and that's simply the fact that most DHT is bound to sex hormone binding globulin found to other various compounds in the body to ultimately come down to net neutral or slightly net neutral. So the bottom line with this is although it's a concern, it is not something you need to be worried about, especially with the normal like one to five gram per day dose of creatine. I would not trip out about that at all. Now the next one is a very real thing, and that's the puffy face, the water retention, all of that. And if you look on the forums online, you're gonna see that talked about. Like people say, I can't take creatine because I hold water. The reality is, is that most people that start holding subcutaneous water are probably taking compounds that have creatine in it, but also have a lot of sugar, also have a lot of other things in it too. Creatine does make you hold water. Creatine gets into the muscle via a sodium dependent transporter, a sodium dependent creatine transporter. Anytime sodium is involved, it's gonna have this osmotic polarizing effect or sort of uh, basically effect where it's drawing water in. So because creatine comes in with sodium, it's naturally gonna pull in water but it's going to pull water into the muscle cell, the muscle belly. So if anything, the water retention that you get should actually come from cell volumization, from muscle cells being engorged with water. The other research that we've seen now, again, looking at over 500 major peer-reviewed papers, is that most of this water retention actually starts to simmer down after a little while. It starts to chill out. The water retention you get in the very beginning is not going to stick with you forever. So when you say, hey, I have creatine, I start getting a puffy face, A, you should look at the kind of creatine you're taking. It should just be straight up creatine monohydrate. 
Okay, there are other compounds that like kind of do different uh, crealkaline versions and different ester. It's, it gets complicated, but in reality, the most ergogenic aid version, the most researched form, is pure cheap monohydrate. And you also don't need to be taking the loading phase dose that they suggest. A lot of times if you go and get a basic creatine, it's gonna recommend that you take like 10 grams, 15 grams for the first one, two, sometimes three weeks to load it. Creatine loading doesn't really need to happen. It, you certainly can, it might increase your stores a little faster, but you increase your risk of water retention, and especially if that particular brand has carbohydrates with it, because carbohydrates can improve the uptake of creatine. We've seen this in the literature. So what that means is a lot of brands will add, say, 30 grams or 40 grams of carbs for every five grams of creatine. So then you're taking 10, 15 grams of creatine, you're looking like an additional 90, 100 grams of carbohydrates coming in, right? That could be a lot. And what does that do? Well, those extra carbohydrates can certainly make you retain water. So you have to really look at what the cause is. What I would typically recommend is like one to three grams of creatine to start, five if you're really training hard and depleting those stores a lot. And you can take less on days you eat more meat. Say, okay, I got up this morning, I had steak and eggs, and then I had a burger for lunch, and then I had a ribeye for dinner. You probably don't even need to take creatine that day. But say tomorrow you have maybe some eggs, and then you have a salad, and then maybe you have some soup. Yeah, you might wanna take creatine that day. Now the other piece that we have to address, it's a big, big drawback, is there's about a 20% chance, up to a 30% chance, that you are what is called a creatine non-responder. And up until recently, we didn't know this was even a thing. So there's a 2023 study in Nutrition Reviews that really highlighted this because we were looking at muscle size and strength, a big review, and they found that a lot of these averages in muscle size were brought down by these outliers, by these outliers that were actually creatine non-responders. So when you have 20 to 30% of people that don't really respond well to creatine, it doesn't mean that they're not responding well like they have adverse effects. It means that they just don't get the same effect that the other 70 or 80% do. You still get an effect, just not as much. Now the research is kind of speculative, but it's suggesting that people that naturally produce less creatine have developed an adaptation to get by with less creatine. So you've become more efficient at not needing creatine, perhaps synthesizing fuel from uh, glycogen stores a little bit faster, being able to create creatine in a different way. So because of that, when you add creatine in exogenously via supplement, the body's just kind of like, meh, I don't really need it. I'm not really asked to use it all the time. So if you don't use it, you lose it kind of thing. Now, what we have to question is that if you were to add creatine in for longer periods of time, do you start to become a responder again? And again, the baseline important information we have to have here is that even a non-responder can still have a nice increase in performance, in strength, in mental function, in even recovery by having this in place. They're just not gonna respond as well. So I say this because some people say, I take creatine and nothing happens. I take creatine and it didn't really work. It's not worth it. That's not true, it's not that it's not worth it. Maybe you're just one of the 20 or 30% that doesn't respond as well. The last thing that I wanna touch on really quick is that it's not super beneficial if you're just like a recreational uh, endurance athlete. It's not gonna help you with your endurance work. And the only reason that it might start to help you is from a recovery aspect and lowering inflammation when you start increasing your mileage, running more, doing you know, longer than like 60 minute bouts of endurance work. Otherwise, it's not really helping you there. But it's still helping you cognitively and it's still helping you with energy because creatine is not a muscle building supplement, it's an energy building supplement. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. See you tomorrow.